Chapter Seven of The Sky Is Falling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Karen Savage. The Sky Is Falling by Lester Del Rey. Chapter Seven. The fall of the sun was seemingly endless. It teetered out of the hole and seemed to hover, spitting great gouts of flame as it encountered the phlogiston layer. Slowly, agonizingly, it picked up speed and began its downward rush. Unlike the sky, it seemed to obey the normal laws of inertia Hansen had known. It swelled bit by bit, raging as it drew nearer, and it seemed to be heading straight for the pyramid. The heat was already rising. It began to sear the skin long before the sun struck the normal atmosphere. Hansen could feel that he was being baked alive. The blood in his arteries seemed to bubble and boil, though that must have been an illusion. But he could see his skin rise in giant blisters and heal almost at once to blister again. He screamed in agony and heard a million screams around him. Then the other screams began to decrease in numbers and weaken in volume, and he knew that the slaves were dying. Through a slit between two fingers he watched the ponderous descent. The light was enough to sear his retinas, but even they healed faster than the damage. He estimated the course of the sun, amazed to find that there was no panic in him, and doubly amazed that he could think at all over the torture that racked his body. Finally, convinced that the sun would strike miles to the south, he rolled across the scorching surface of the stone block and dropped to the north side of it. The shock of landing must have broken bones, but a moment later he could begin to breathe again. The heat was still intense, even behind the stone block, but it was bearable, at least for him. Pieces were breaking off the sun as it fell, and already striking the ground. One fell near, and its heat seared at him, giving him no place of shelter. Then the sun struck, sending up earth tremors that knocked him from his feet. He groped up and stared around the block. The sun had struck near the horizon, throwing up huge masses of material. Its hissing against the ground was a tumult in his ears, and superheated ash and debris began to fall. So far as he could see, there were no other survivors in the camp. Three million slaves had died. Those who had found some shelter behind the stonework had lived longer than the others, but that had only increased their suffering. And even his body must have come close to its limits if it could be killed at all. He was still in danger. If a salamander could destroy even such a body as his, then the fragments of the sun that were still roiling across the landscape would be fatal. The only hope he had was to get as far away from the place where the sun had struck as he could. He braced himself to leave even the partial shelter. There was a pile of water-skins near the base of the block, held in the charred remains of an attendant's body. The water was boiling, but there was still some left. He poured several skins together and drank the stuff, forcing himself to endure the agony of its passage down his throat. Without it he'd be dehydrated before he could get a safe distance away. Then he ran. The desert was like molten iron under his bare feet, and the savage radiation on his back was worse than any overseer's whip. His mind threatened to blank out with each step, but he forced himself on. And slowly, as the distance increased, the sun's pyre sank further and further over the horizon. The heat should still have been enough to kill any normal body in fifteen minutes, but he could endure it. He stumbled on in a trot, guiding himself by the stars that shone in the broken sky toward a section of this world where there had been life and some measure of civilization before. After a few hours the tongues of flame no longer flared above the horizon, though the brilliant radiance continued and Hansen found that his strong and nearly indestructible body still had limits. It could not go on without rest forever. He was sobbing with fatigue at every step. He managed to dig a small hollow in the sand before dropping off to sleep. It was a sleep of total exhaustion, lacking even a sense of time. It might have been minutes or hours that he slept, and he had no way of knowing which. With the sun gone, and the stars rocking into dizzy new configurations, there was no night or day, nor any way to guess the passage of time. He woke to a roaring wind that sent cutting blasts of sand driving against him. He staggered up and forced himself against it, away from the place where the sun had fallen. Even through the lashing sandstorm he could see the glow near the horizon. Now a pillar of something that looked like steam, but was probably vapor from molten and evaporated rocks, was rising upwards, like the mushroom clouds of his own days. 
It was spreading apparently just under the phlogiston layer, reflecting back the glare. And the wind was caused by the great rising column of superheated gases over the sun. He staggered on, while the sand gave way slowly to patches of green. With the sun gone, and the sky falling into complete shreds, this world was certainly doomed. He'd assumed that the sun of this world must be above the sky, but he'd been wrong. Like the other heavenly bodies, it had been embedded inside the shell. He had discovered that the sky material resisted any sudden stroke, but that other matter could be interpenetrated into it, as the stars were. He had even been able to pass his hand and arm completely through the sample. Apparently the sun had passed through the sky in a similar manner. Then why hadn't the shell melted? He had no real answer. The sun must have been moving fast enough so that no single spot became too hot, or else the phlogiston layer somehow dissipated the heat. The cloud of glowing stuff from the rising air column was spreading out now, reflecting the light and heat back to the earth. There was a chance that most of one hemisphere might retain some measure of warmth then. At least there was still light enough for him to travel safely. By the time he was too tired to go on again, he had come to the beginnings of fertile land. He passed a village, but it had been looted, and he skirted around it rather than stare at the ghastly ghoul-work of the looters. The world was ending, but civilization seemed to have ended already. Beyond it he came to a rude house, now abandoned. He staggered in gratefully. For a change he had one piece of good luck. His first attempt at magic produced food. At the sound of the snapping fingers in his hoarse-voiced abracadabra, a dirty pot of hot and greasy stew came into existence. He had no cutlery, but his hands served well enough. When it was gone, he felt better. He wiped his hands on the breech clout. Whatever the material in the cloth, it had stood the sun's heat almost as well as he had. Then he paused, as his hand found a lump under the cloth. He drew out the apprentice magician's book. The poor devil had never achieved his twenty lifetimes, and this was probably all that was left of him. Hansen stared at it, reading the title in some surprise. Applied Semantics. He propped himself up and began to scan it, wondering what it had to do with magic. He'd had a course of semantics in college, and could see no relationship. But he soon found that there were differences. This book began with the axiomatic statement that the symbol is the thing. From that it developed in great detail the fact that any part of a whole bearing similarity to the whole was also the whole. That each seven was the class of all sevens, and other details of the science of magical similarity followed quite logically from the single axiom. Hansen was surprised to find that there was a highly developed logic to it. Once he accepted the axiom, and he was no longer prepared to doubt it here, he could follow the book far better than he'd been able to follow his own course in semantics. Apparently this was supposed to be a difficult subject, from the constant efforts of the writer to make his point clear. But after learning to deal with electron holes and transistors, this was elementary study for Hansen. The second half of the book dealt with the use of the true name. That, of course, was the perfect symbol, and hence the true whole. There was the simple ritual of giving a secret name. Apparently, any man who discovered a principle or device could use a name for it, just as parents could give one to their children and there were the laws for using the name. Unfortunately, just when Hansen was beginning to make some sense of it, the book ended. Obviously there was a lot more to be covered in later courses. He tossed the book aside, shivering as he realized that his secret name was common knowledge. The wonder was that he could exist at all. And while there was supposed to be a ritual for relinquishing one name and taking another, that was one of the higher mysteries not given. In the morning, he stopped to magic up some more food and the clothing he would need if he ever found the trace of civilized people again. The food was edible, though he'd never particularly liked cereal. He seemed to be getting the hang of abracadabraing up what was in his mind, but the clothing was a problem. Everything he got turned out to be the right size, but he couldn't see himself in hauberk and greaves, nor in a filmy nightgown. Finally, he managed something that was adequate, if the brilliant floral sport shirt could be said to go with Levi pants and a morning frock. But he felt somewhat better in it. He finally left the frock behind, however. It was still too hot for that. He walked on briskly, watching for signs of life and speculating on the principles of applied semantics, name magic, and similarity. 
he could begin to understand how an Einstein might read through one of the advanced books here and make leaps in theory beyond what the Sefari had developed. They'd had it too easy. Magic that worked tended to overcome the drive for the discipline needed to get the most out of it. Any good theoretician from Hansen's world could probably make fools of these people. Maybe that was why the Sefari had gone scrounging back through other worlds to find men who had the necessary drive to get things done when the going was tough. Twice he passed abandoned villages, but there was nothing there for him. He was coming toward forested ground now, something like the country in which the Sons of the Egg had found refuge. The thought of that made him go slower. But for a long time there was no further sign of life. The woods thinned out to grasslands, and he went on for hours more before he spotted a cluster of lights ahead. As he drew nearer he saw that the lights seemed to be fluorescents. They were coming from corrugated iron sheds that looked like aircraft hangars strung together. There was a woven wire fence around the structures, and a sign that said simply, Project 85. In the half-light from the sky he could see a well-kept lawn, and there were a few groups of men standing about idly. Most wore white coveralls, though two were dressed in simple business suits. Hansen moved forward purposefully, acting as if he had urgent business. If he stopped, there would be questions, he suspected. He wanted to find answers, not to answer idle questions. There was no one at the desk in the little reception alcove, but he heard the sound of voices through a side door leading out. He went through it, to find a larger yard with more men idling. There should be someone here who knew more of what was going on in this world than he did now. His choice in the long run seemed to lie between Bork and the Sethari, unless he could find some way of hiding himself from both sides. At the moment he was relatively free for the first time since they had brought him here, and he wanted to make sure that he could make the most use of the fact. Nobody asked anything. He slowed, drifting along the perimeter of the group of men, and still nobody paid him any attention. Finally, he dropped onto the ground near a group of half a dozen men who looked more alert than the rest. They seemed to be reminiscing over old times. Two thirty-eight an hour with overtime and double time for the swing shift. We really had it made then. And every Saturday, never fail, the General would come out from Murak and tell us we were the heroes of the home front, with overtime pay while we listened to him. Yeah, but what if you wanted to quit? Suppose you didn't like your shift boss or somebody. You go down and get your time, and they hand you your draft notice. Me, I liked it better in forty-six. Not so much pay, but— Hansen pricked up his ears. The conversation told him more than he needed to know. He stood up and peered through the windows of the shed. There, unattended under banks of lights, stood half-finished aircraft shapes. He wouldn't get much information here, it seemed. These were obviously reanimates, men who'd been pulled from his own world and set to work. They could do their duties and their memories were complete, but they were lacking some essential thing that had gone out of them before they were brought here. Unless he could find one among them who was either a mandrake man housing a soul, or one of the few reanimates who seemed almost fully human, he'd get little information. But he was curious as to what the Sethari had expected to do with aircraft. The rocks had better range and altitude than any planes of equal hauling power. He located one man who seemed a little brighter than the others. The fellow was lying on the ground, staring at the sky with his hands clasped behind his head. From time to time he frowned, as if the sight of the sky was making him wonder. The man nodded as Hansen dropped down beside him. "'Hi. Just get here, Mac?' "'Yeah,' Hansen assented. "'What's the score?' The man sat up and made a disgusted noise. "'Who knows?' he answered. There was more emotion in his voice than might be expected from a reanimate. In real life, on his own world, he must have had an amazing potential for even that much to carry over. We're dead. We're dead and we're here and they tell us to make helicopters. So we make them, working like dogs to make a deadline. Then just as the first one comes off the line, the power fails. No more juice. The head engineer took off in the one we finished. He was going to find out what gives, but he never came back. So we sit. He spat on the ground. I wish they'd left me dead after the plant blew up. I'm not myself since then. What in hell would they need with helicopters? Hansen asked. The man shrugged. Beats me. But I'm beginning to figure some things out. They got some kind of trouble with the sky. I figure they got confused in bringing us here. This shop is one that made those big cargo copters they call skyhooks, and maybe they thought the things were just what they're called. All I know is they kept us working five solid weeks for nothing. 
I knew the power was going to fail. They had the craziest damn generating plan you ever saw, and it couldn't last. The boilers kept sizzling and popping their safety valves with no fire in the box. Just some little old man sitting in a corner, practicing the Masonic grip or something over a smudge pod. Hansen gestured back to the sheds. If there's no power, what are those lights? Which lights, they told us, the man explained. Saved a lot of wiring or something. They— Hey, what's that? He was looking up, and Hansen followed his gaze. There was something whizzing overhead, at jet-plane speed. A piece of the sky falling? he said. The man snorted. Falling sidewise? Not likely, even here. I tell you, pal, I don't like this place. Nothing works right. There was no fuel for the copter we finished, the one we called Betsy Ann. But the little geezer who worked the smudge pot just walked up to it and wiggled his finger. Start your motor going, Betsy Ann, he ordered, with some other mumbo-jumbo. Then the motor roared, and he and the engineer took off at double the speed you could make on high-test gas. Hey, there it is again. Doesn't look like Betsy Ann coming back, either. The something whizzed by again, in the other direction, but lower and slower. It made a gigantic but erratic circle beyond the sheds and swooped back. It looked nothing like a helicopter. It looked like a Halloween decoration of a woman on a broomstick. As it came nearer, Hansen saw that it was a woman on a broomstick, flying erratically. She straightened out in a flat glide. She came in for a one-point landing a couple of yards away. The tip of the broom handle hit the ground, and she went sailing over it to land on her hands and knees. She got up, facing the shed. The woman was Nima. Her face was mask-like, her eyes tortured. She was staring searchingly around her, looking at every man. "'Nima!' Hansen cried. She spun to face him and gasped. Her skin seemed to turn gray, and her eyes opened to double their normal size. She took one tottering step toward him and halted. Illusion, she whispered hoarsely, and slumped to the ground in a faint. She was reviving before he could raise her from the ground. She swayed a moment, staring at him. You're not dead. What's so wonderful about that around here? he asked, but not with much interest. With the world going to pot, and only a few days left, the girl's face and the slim young body under it were about all the reality left worth thinking about. He grabbed for her, pulling her to him. Bertha had never made him feel like that. She managed to avoid his lips and slid away from him. But they used the snether knife. Dave Hansen, you never died. It was only induced illusion by that—that that bork. And to think that I nearly died of grief while you were enjoying yourself here. You—you you mandrake man!" He grunted. He'd almost managed to forget what he was, and he didn't enjoy having the aircraft worker find out. He turned to see what the reaction was, and then stared open-mouthed at his surroundings. There were no lights from the plane factory. In fact, there was no plane factory. In the half-light of the sky, he saw that the plant was gone. No men were left. There was only barren earth, with a tiny, limp sapling in the middle of empty acres. What happened? Nima glanced around briefly and sighed. It's happening all over. They created the plane plant by the law of identities, from that little plane-tree sapling, I suppose. It is a plane plant, after all. But, with the conjunctions and signs failing, all such creations are returning to their original form, unless a spell is used continually over them. Even then sometimes we fail. Most of the projects vanished after the sun fell." Hansen remembered the man with whom he'd been talking before Nima appeared. He'd have liked to know such a man before death and revivification had ruined him. It wasn't fair that anyone with character enough to be that human, even as a zombie, should be wiped out without even a moment's consideration. Then he remembered the man's own estimate of his current situation. Maybe he was better off returned to the death that had claimed him. Reluctantly he returned to his own problems. All right, then. If you thought I was dead, what are you doing here, Nima? I felt the compulsion begin even before I returned to the city. I thought I was going mad. I tried to forget you, but the compulsion grew until I could fight it no longer. She shuddered. It was a terrible flight. The carpets will not work at all now, and I could hardly control the broom. Sometimes it wouldn't lift. Twice it sailed so high I could hardly breathe, and I had no hope of finding you. Yet I went on. I've been flying when I could for three days now." Bork, of course, hadn't known of her spell with which she'd forced herself to want him well and truly. Apparently it had gone on operating, even when she thought he was dead, and with a built-in sense of his direction. Well, she was here, and he wasn't sorry. Hansen took another look across the plains toward the glowing hell of the horizon. He reached for her and pulled her to him. 
She was firm and sweet against him, and she was trembling in response to his urging. At the last moment she pulled back. "'You forget yourself, Dave Hansen. I am a registered and certified virgin. My blood is needed for—for for spells that won't work anyhow,' he told her harshly. "'The sky isn't falling now, kid. It's down. Or most of it. But—' She hesitated, then let herself come a trifle closer. Her voice was doubtful. "'It's true that our spells are failing. Not even the surest magic is reliable. The world has gone mad, and even magic is no longer trustworthy, but—' He was just pulling her close enough again, and feeling her arms lift to his neck, when the ground shook behind them, and there was a sound of great, jarring, thudding steps. Hansen jerked around to see a great rock making its landing run, heading straight for them. The huge bird braked savagely, barely stopping before they were under its feet. From its back, a ladder of some flexible material snaked down, and men began descending. The first were mandrakes in the uniform of the Safari, all carrying weapons with evil-looking blades or sharp stickers. The last man off was Bork. He came toward Hansen and Nima, with a broad grin on his face. "'Greetings, Dave Hansen. You do manage to survive, don't you? And my little virgin sister, without whose flight I might not have found you. Well, come along. The rock's growing impatient.'" End of chapter 7